All right, uh, let's pray uh, to prepare our hearts for worship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just this opportunity to worship you today. Lord, minister to us, please. Lord, speak to us. Lord, let it not just be another service, but let it change and transform who we are. Let it take us to a level that we've never been for spiritually in our relationship with you. Oh Lord, please minister to us. Please use your spirit to powerfully speak to us and change us. Use the word of God to change our lives, to change our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, GBC. Uh, these are the announcements for today. I hope everybody's doing well and uh, we miss everyone and we are praying for everyone. And we just want you to know that uh, we love you guys very, very much. Uh, let me just uh, share some announcements with you. First of all, congratulations again to the seniors that have graduated this year. Last week, we congratulated Brittany. So congratulations, Brittany, once again. But also this week, we're going to congratulate Sophia. Sophia, Dao's daughter, Sophia has um, uh, graduated also from high school and she will be now uh, going to college and uh, she's done with high school. So let's keep Sophia in our prayers. Uh, send her a text, a call, uh, and if you can meet, uh, meet with her and you know, just show her some love. Uh, so congratulations, Sophia, and we hope and pray uh, that God will lead you in a path that will be of most blessing uh, to you. Uh, also, next week, we're going to do communion, so please have the elements ready for next week. Today, uh, ne starting next week, we're going to start a new sermon series, uh, and the topic is going to be worship. We're going to talk a little bit about worship starting next week. It's a new sermon series on worship, uh, simply because we are getting ready to uh, start to worship in our building again. So I wanted to prepare our hearts uh, by worshiping, uh, by talking about worship and how we should approach worship as a church. So starting next week, we're gonna start a new sermon series uh, with the topic of worship. On that note, along the same lines, um, let me just share with you a little bit about what's happening with, uh, what's gonna be happening with worship uh, moving forward for GBC. Last week, the council had a meeting and we decided to uh, listen to uh, the concerns that our church had and go with what, what the majority wanted. The majority wanted to still continue uh, to worship from home. And uh, they, they did not feel comfortable um, getting in person just yet. So we're going to honor that uh, desire and we're going to continue to worship from home. That's what the council decided last week, that we're going to continue to worship from home, at least for the month of June. For the month of June, worship is going to continue to be the same way that it has been so far. So we're going to do online worship and Zoom right after. But one thing we did want to add, starting from the month of June, if it's at all possible to you, and if you are okay with doing that, for those of you who are okay uh, meeting other people, we wanted to ask you to start worshiping with other believers from GBC that live nearby you or that you're closed with or that you're close to, you know, just go to their homes, not too many, but just, you know, one or two families together, you know, uh, gather together and worship from home together, still watching the service online, but doing it together in person. So there's this, you know, personal touch of, you know, meeting other human beings and worshiping together. So you can start doing that starting June. You can actually, if you're comfortable doing so, we encourage you to either worship from home like you have been doing so, or gather with one or two more families and worship together from someone's, ha from someone's house uh, and, and, and worship together like that online and join us for Zoom after. And, and you can, we, we encourage you to do that in a safe way and in a way that you know, you're comfortable doing. So. You can try that if you would like. After June, uh, we, we re I, I got a message from our building ownership a couple of days ago that now uh, it's okay for us to move back into the building and start worshiping. Today, they're disinfecting everything. 
Unfortunately, there's, they said that there's like cockroaches in the building now because it's been empty for a long time. So they're going to take care of that. They're going to disinfect the building and they're going to, uh, you know, provide the necessary things that we need to stay safe, like a thermometer, um, a sanitizers. And also Ron is going to prepare more from our church so we can have more than enough for our members. And they're going to give us guidelines as to how to use the restrooms and things like that so we can worship uh, in a safe environment. Uh, but nonetheless, they said that now we can actually start technically meeting in our building. Uh, we're not going to do that yet. Like we said, in, in June, we're going to still worship online. However, uh, after we have another meeting with the council soon, most likely we're going to decide to start gathering in person, possibly in July. Uh, we're going to let you know the exact details after we have the meeting. But most likely it's looking like we might be able to start gathering in-person worship uh, starting July and we'll let you know all the details and uh, about that next week um, but here, here's the thing even after we start meeting in person we will still continue the online services so if you're not comfortable coming to church just quite yet you don't have to you can stay home as long as you need to stay home when you feel comfortable about coming back when psychologically you're able to do that you know you can come then we're going to continue to offer online services for the time being and possibly this is going to con a min this is going to be a ministry that's going to continue for the long haul for gbc so from now on we're going to offer online worship service and possibly as soon as july in-person worship so you have both options so you can choose whichever one you 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 want and whatever you're comfortable with so that's kind of how we're approaching the situation and that's what's going to be happening in the month of June and, 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 and most likely July. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me uh, or any of the council members at any time or even through our Zoom meeting today after the service. Um, online giving is now uh, operating in our website. So you now have an option to give online uh, at GBC. If you go to our church website, you're going to find the link uh, that directly leads you to, you know, directions of how you can give online. So now, starting right now at this very moment, you can actually now give online or you can also continue to give by mail. Now you have two options to give online or by mail when it comes to your offering starting today. Um, thank you, Andrew, by the way, for setting up online offering. And thank you, Chris, for putting the link on our website. Also, uh, in a couple of weeks is Father's Day. Father's Day this year is June 20th. And, you know, we had the mothers do a lot of work when it was Mother's Day. So now we're going to ask a lot from our fathers because men should lead by example. Uh, for Father's Day, you have a couple of weeks to work on this. I'm going to ask you that starting from today until our next worship uh, before Father's Day, which is a couple of weeks from now, by June 20th, by June 20th, I want you to cook a very nice meal for your whole family. I, I need the father to do this. The father needs to prepare a very nice family meal for their family. And you're going to share with us what you made for your family on June 20th when we have our Zoom gathering. Also, I want you to share as a father how, what was the most memorable thing your family did for you. Uh, for Father's Day, how your family showed you love for Father's Day. So share with us what you cooked for your family, how the meal was like, and share with us what your family did for you, how they appreciated you uh, for being their father. Uh, if you are not a father yet, uh, or if your father is not here, uh, still remember that you do have and for all of us, our ultimate father is our heavenly father. But if you're not a father yet, or if your father is not here at the moment, we encourage you to bless somebody else's father. Find somebody you respect, find somebody that has made a difference in your life, somebody that has influenced your life, somebody that has invested in your life, and honor them that day. Bless them that day and share with us how you are able to do that. All right, those are all the announcements for today. I hope everything was clear. If not, feel free to contact me at any time. 
We will see you after the service.
so we are taking a break from the book of Psalms and also Joseph. Uh, we're switching to Job uh, just because of you know everything that uh, is going on. Uh, mainly I wanted to preach from the book of Job because I wanted to preach about pain. <clears throat> There's so much pain everywhere right now, no matter where you look, it seems. Intense pain, intense suffering, and as I was kind of trying to process everything that was going on around us and, you know, the pain that I was feeling and trying to see, you know, how we can uh, be ministered from the Word of God, um, you know, when it comes to going through intense pain, I... Um, I, I was reminded of Job uh, because there's nobody um, that has gone through more pain, intense pain, severe suffering at a personal level uh, other than Jesus. Um, perhaps, you know, Job is, is next in line. He did experience so much suffering, so much pain. And I wanted us to see, you know, where that pain led Job. Um, right now we have so much pain right now we are in, in so much intense pain because of everything that has been happening now and actually for the whole year of 2020 it's just been one thing after another non-stop that's kind of what Job went through one thing after another non-stop suffering non-stop pain and right now we have a lot of pain but we have to do something with this pain we have to direct this pain in the right direction. Uh, this pain can actually lead us to the most beautiful of places if we know how to direct and lead uh, the pain that you know, we are in right now. So I just wanted us to see how Job led his extreme suffering, his intense pain, into a, a, a place of, you know, of beauty, how he was able to do that uh, so that you and I can also know how to lead this pain that we're in right now, that we're feeling right now as Christians uh, today. Uh, so, you know, let's look into the book of Job, um, chapter 1, if you have your Bibles. That's Job. Chapter 1, we're going to read the entire chapter. Job chapter 1, uh, this is what it says. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast at the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and, and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, 
a blameless and upright man who fear God for no reason. Have you not put a hedge around him uh, who fear God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered, the, Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has in, is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding aside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, there, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their older brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Uh, Job is a timeless message for a universal audience uh, because it's the topic of suffering. Suffering is not for one specific time in history, not for a specific audience, is for people of all times and for uh, every audience that has ever lived. And the message, it's timeless because everybody uh, goes through suffering, including us even today in 2020. Uh, Job, uh, you know, he was probably as godly as it gets, one of the godliest men that ever lived. And he was not even an Israelite. This is a non-Israelite. He was born in Uz, which we don't really know where that is. There's not that much information about it. Uh, but what we do know is that it was outside of Israel. And Job was from Uz, so we know that he was a non-Israelite. He was not, he was a, he, he was a non-Israelite. Yet he was so devout to the God of Scripture, to the Israelite God, to the, to the God of the Israelites. Um, he was a devout, devout follower. He was a very godly man. Uh, he was as good as it gets. He was not sinless or perfect, but he got pretty close. This is the man that would have been voted the best man of the year. Uh, universally uh, because of how great of a man, of a Christian, of a devout follower of God he was. Uh, he, you know, t in the beginning, two words describe his character. He was blameless and upright. Blameless means that he loved the law of God. He loved to obey God. He loved to walk with God. He loved to fellowship with God. He loved to wholeheartedly serve God. And he was a man of integrity, character. He was blameless, spotless. Upright means more something like he daily made sure to live in accordance, in obedience to applying the word of God in his life. It also means that he treated people with respect. He was just with people. He was fair. Um, he was a man honest man. 
and he was passionate, passionate, and and about about showing mercy to people who were less fortunate, uh, to the unfortunate. Uh, this is who Job was. This is the CEO that everybody would have loved, the CEO that everybody would have dreamed about having, the CEO that everybody would have worked for with no pay because he was such a wonderful, godly man who really loved people, was loved God, loved people, and, and treated people with dignity and respect and fairness and honesty and love and compassion and mercy. This was a good man. This was a godly man, a devout man. And we can see that he, his faith was devout because the next two words describe his faith. He was a man that feared God. He was a man that feared God. In the Old Testament, the, the pinnacle of wisdom, the, the highest point of wisdom, where wisdom begins is by the fear of men. Those who are wise are those who understand the fear of God. Job was a wise man. He feared God. To fear God simply means that we love God, that we trust God, that we are in awe and reverence of God. To fear God means that we are so scared uh, that we're going to sin against Him, that, that we, we don't want to sin against Him. We're so careful to not sin against him, against him, to not displease Him because we love Him that much. You know, you, you, you respect God so much, you're in so, such awe and reverence of God, you love God so much that it kills you to hurt Him. It kills you uh, to sin against Him. You, you do everything you possibly can to not hurt God uh, by sinning against Him. It's kind of like, you know, what Pastor Francis Chan was saying that people these days are so careful about, you know, not touching, the, uh, you know, a surface, wearing a mask, staying, you know, a distance from people so that they will not get the virus. They're so careful to not get the virus. Job was so careful to not sin uh, because, you know, he feared the Lord. He loved the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. He, 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 he it killed him uh, to, to sin against God because he didn't want to hurt God because he loved God so much. God was his life. Uh, this is what it means to fear the Lord, to love him so much that you would hate more than anything to hurt him in any way. And so he tried very, uh, to try, try to be very careful not to hurt God. He feared the Lord. Not only did he fear the Lord, it, it is because he feared the Lord that he shunned evil. Uh, he, was, he was able to not sin. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't sinless. But he was able to, you know, uh, to shun evil because he feared the Lord. This is usually what happens. If you fear God, then you sin less. You fear everything else less. You don't fear people, so you don't have to sin. The more you fear God, the more the fear of the Lord grows in your life, the less you fear everything else. The less you fear people, the less you fear, so the less you have to sin, and the more courage you have to shun evil away. This is how it works. You just grow in the fear of the Lord, and you start to fear everything else less, and you start to have the confidence and the power to be able to not do evil, to not sin, because you love God so much, because you fear Him so much. This is who Job was. It was a wise man. This, this was a, a devout man in his faith. This was a godly man, a good man, a good boss. And it is more remarkable, you know, how wonderful Job, uh, Job was because this guy was rich. He was wealthy. He was powerful. Actually, he was the greatest man in the East. In his region, in his area, he was the richest, most powerful man. He didn't let the riches get to him. He didn't let success get to him. He didn't let all that God blessed him with to get to him. He was a devout follower of God despite all of the success and the wealth and the riches and the power that he had. He wasn't just a, any rich man. He was the most powerful man of the East. Job is the Amazon of our times in a godly way, 
a godly version of Amazon was Job. This guy was wealthy, this guy was rich, this guy was powerful. This is why it makes it more remarkable that he's so godly because he was such a successful man. You know, like it, it, it mentions that he had, um, you know, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 uh, camels, 500 donkeys, and female donkeys, and, and much more. You know, e even the numbers here, number seven, number three, 3,000, 7,000, is, is trying to show us, you know, how staggering his wealth was. These are numbers that signify perfection. So he's trying to show us how complete his wealth is, how complete, how complete his success is. It's staggering. It's beyond the imagination. This man was successful. It was, he was powerful. He was wealthy. He was the most, the greatest man in the East. You know, camels were not, were animals that only the super rich could have. They were prestigious animals even back then, and Job had 3,000 of them. Job had not only a lot, but he had the best of the best. He not only had donkeys, but here the details that the passage gives us, he had female donkeys, which were better than male donkeys because they can give milk and they can have offspring. <clears throat> Uh, so he not only did he have a lot, but he had the best quality of a lot. He had camels, he had female donkeys. And then not only that, but he had a good family. Uh, even when, you know, when it gives us the numbers of uh, his children, he had seven sons and three daughters. Uh, all, again, numbers that signify perfection, that it's showing us he had the ideal family. He had a good family and, and then his children, you know, they, they loved each other. Their relationships were good that even as adults, they love meeting with each other and celebrating together. They love one another. They love their dad. And Job was, was a spiritual leader of the home because every time his kids would get together, he would call them over at home and offer burnt sacrifices with them on their behalf just in case they might have sinned against God in the midst of their celebrations. And here, most likely, the sin that they committed in their hearts, it means something like, you know, perhaps them getting a little bit too prideful, them getting a little bit too happy about the success and the wealth that they had, that they started to forget God and they started to give too much credit for themselves, that they stopped fearing God and they started to actually give credit to themselves and not God in case they might have done that, you know, in their hearts, not even like showed it outside, but in case they might, thoughts like that might have, might have even risen in them, Job actually, you know, starts to offer burnt offerings uh, of, of, and sacrifices these burnt offerings in case they might have sinned against God so God would forgive them. This is how, you know, perfect Job's life was. This is how godly he was. This is how perfect he was he had everything and above everything else this man was a godly man he had you know countless servants they're not even numbered here the servants are the only ones who are not numbered meaning he probably had too many to number he had animals too many to count in the thousands he had camels he had the perfect family, the ideal family. They loved each other. They loved their dad. They also, you know, followed God. They worshiped together as a family. Job was a spiritual leader of the home. Everything was going great. He had it all going for him. And, uh, and, this, and, and, and this is how Job's life was like. And then we see uh, the story shift from Job and all of his success and wealth and his family and what's happening on earth to all of a sudden shift to God, his angels and Satan and what's happening in the heavenly courts. Things shift from earth to heaven and we get a glimpse of, you know, what, uh, what's happening uh, between God and Satan in the story. Um, and the story shifts to you know, God and, and his angels uh, that, are, that are serving him and also with a conversation that he has with Satan. Yes, you heard me right. The meeting was between God, his angels, and Satan. Satan was part of it. Now, before we go any further, let me just give you a little bit of a summary 
uh, and, and some details about Satan because he's mentioned here. So that you can kind of have an idea, a picture, uh, a definition of, you know, how to process and think about Satan as a Christian. And I'm about to read to you from the Kregel uh, Dictionary of the Bible and Theology to give you just a glimpse and a summary of uh, who Satan is. Satan is an angel. God created Satan, so he was once a righteous angel. Satan rebelled against God. After Satan rebelled against God, he was removed from his original position, though not from access to God. And this is why we can see that today he has access to God. He was removed from his original position, but he wasn't removed from having access to God. That, you know, that partly explains why Satan can have access to God today. Satan introduced sin into God's universe. Satan is a leader of the angels who rebelled against God. Satan is known as a tempter, a master deceiver, a liar, the father of lies. He is ruler of the demons, also ruler of unbelievers, a roaring lion, meaning he destroys Christians, especially the weaker and more, more vulnerable ones every time he gets a chance. Satan opposes God by also opposing God's people and the work that they do. He can, he can use animals, natural forces, sickness, and death as God allows to do so for his evil work. He can also oppress, possess people, manipulate, cause spiritual warfare through his demons, and he can entice people to follow him. He is ruler of this world and he exercises world dominion with the help of his demons and unbelievers. He has great power compared to human beings, but he's nonetheless a created angel who is subject to God's sovereign will as we see in our passage today as well. He can only do what God gives him permission to do. He has no authority that God does not allow. Sometimes God uses Satan for his purposes like the disciplining of his people. Believers can stand against the power of Satan by, by using spiritual weapons provided to us. Christians are to be aware of Satan, but to focus on Christ and his works. God pronounced judgment on Satan in the garden in Genesis, and he along with all the demons that follow him and unbelievers that follow him will eventually be cast down to, the, to spend the rest of eternity in the lake of fire, where he will suffer for the rest of eternity. Satan is also known as the accuser. That's one of his titles, and that's the title that he plays on today. Satan is the one that accuses God to people and people to God. And Satan today is accusing Job to God. God says, isn't my servant Job great? He is the best of the best. There is no one like him on earth. This is God's favorite servant, a non-Israelite. There's no one as blameless and upright. There's no one uh, that fears God and shuns evil like Job. God brags about Job. Uh, and this is when Satan starts to accuse Job. And he says to God, you know what? You're wrong, God. He basically says, Job is not as good as you think he is. I mean, look at everything you've given him. You've blessed him beyond, you know, anybody's wildest dreams. You're always pr protecting him. You put a hedge around him. Uh, you know, he doesn't really love you. You know, he, he, he just worships you because you have been good to him. Now you take all of your blessings away and I guarantee you, he will curse you. That's what basically Satan said to, to, to God. Job doesn't really love God. Job doesn't really love you, God. He's just being nice to you because you're being super nice to him. Take all of that away. Strike him. Remove all of that, all the blessings, the gifts you've given him, and you'll see that he doesn't love you. He'll curse you to your face. Sadly, Satan actually does have a point. Uh, this, is a, this is a question that we must all ask ourselves as Christians. Do we really love God or do we love the things that God gives to us? 
If God were, re were to remove all the blessing that he has given us in life, will we curse God or not? According to Satan, even the godliest man, one of the godliest men that, that has ever lived, will curse God, meaning every other Christian will do the same. How about you? What do you think? Do you think if God were to remove everything that he has given you, if he, would, if he were to stop blessing you, would you curse God? Uh, do you really love God or do you love the life that God has given you? Do you love the things that God has given you? Do you love the blessings that God has given you? That's what you know, Satan wanted to tell God, that Job doesn't love God. He only loves God. The blessings that God has given him. And so God allows Job uh, to strike Satan. But he says, do not lay a finger on him. Do not touch his body. Do not harm him in any way. But, you know, go and do whatever you think you need to do to prove your point. That God really, uh, that Job really loves the things that God has given him, not really God. So God does allow Satan to strike Job, but he puts limitations on the strike. Now here's where we need to talk a little bit about suffering. Uh, because uh, whether we realize it or not, our understanding of suffering is wrong many times is limited many times. And although today, you know, we won't be able to fully understand the concept of suffering, at the very least from Job, we should get somewhat of a, of a little bit of a better understanding of suffering than what we already have and correct the wrong preconceived understanding of suffering that we have now. Many times Christians over the years and here in the book of Job, later on when you continue to read the book of, read the book of Job, it's the same mistake that Job's godly friends make with Job, but it's the same mistake that Christians have been committing for centuries now, even to this day, when it comes to suffering. When it comes to suffering, we as Christians, we are too simplistic and moralistic about suffering. Our, our understanding of suffering is very limited and oftentimes wrong. Actually, in the book of Job, at the very end, when God speaks again, God tells Job's friends that they were wrong about suffering. Because what they kept on telling Job was that Job was suffering because he sinned against God. In, in other words, they had a very simplistic, moralistic understanding of suffering. That if you're good, God blesses you. But if you're suffering, you must have done something wrong. And that's why there must be some kind of sin in your life. And that's why you're suffering. That's too simplistic, too moralistic. And God says that definition of, 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 of suffering is not complete, is wrong. And he tells the friends that they're wrong and he tells, ask Job to pray for you so that I can forgive you. Because you're wrong. All your counsel about suffering was wrong. He's, is, Job is, is helping us understand that as Christians, sometimes we're just too simple when it comes to suffering. Our understanding of suffering is too simplistic, is too limited, is too small, is wrong many times. It's too moralistic. It's, it, because... because you know, Job is proving to us that it's not that the sinners suffer and, and, the, and the righteous are blessed, but the righteous suffer when they do nothing wrong. He's completely shattering this simplistic view of suffering that you only suffer if you sin. Job was the godliest man, one of the godliest men that ever lived. He was so careful to not sin again. He feared God. He did nothing wrong. He's a righteous man. But God allowed a righteous man to suffer. It's shattering our moralistic, simplistic view of suffering that only the sinners suffer. That only when, you, when you're suffering, you did something wrong. No, you can be doing everything right. You can be as godly as possible and you still might suffer. It's... it's, it's is shattering our moralism, 
a moralistic view of suffering. Because Job was a righteous man who suffered. How can God allow a righteous man to suffer? How can a good God not just allow suffering, but how can a good God allow suffering in the life of a righteous man? That's what Job is showing us. That many times for Christians who have grown up in the church, our concept, our understanding of suffering is too simplistic. It's too moralistic. It is not that we suffer because we sin all the time, although that's true. But that's just one view of suffering, a very limited view. Today's passage is showing us that we can do everything right. We can be the most righteous of, of Christians and we can also suffer. Uh, on the other hand, many times there is, uh, on the other spectrum, there's you know, usually non-believers who say uh, that they don't want to believe in God because of suffering. They don't want to believe in God because God allows suffering. They say, how can a good God, if, if a good God really exist, existed, how can there be suffering in the world? They say, how can a good God allow suffering? Uh, Job takes it further. How can a good God allow righteous people to suffer? But usually that's the other spectrum of people who have a limited understanding and a wrong view of suffering. They usually say, I don't want to believe in God because He allows suffering. He's not a good God. He, he, he allows suffering. I cannot follow God. I cannot believe in God because there's suffering in the world. Many times people say, that's also wrong. That's also limited view of suffering. Because it, even in our passage today, God didn't start anything. Jo I mean, Satan was the one who started everything. Satan was the one who proposed all of these ideas to strike uh, Job. God didn't start anything. God didn't have any ideas of, 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 of striking Job. It was all Satan. So we need to understand that there's an adversary, but it's not God. Satan is the one who started the evil, the wickedness against Job. It was not God. God does not delight in evil. God does not delight in our pain. God does not delight in our suffering. God does not initiate wickedness and evil and pain. Even the world that we live in, it, it's fallen and sinful, not because God created it that way, but because we sinned. So it was never God's fault to begin with. Even in our passage, it's us and it's Satan, the reason why suffering exists. Um, and, and that's what we can see. But, but also we need to, a third thing that we learned about suffering here. So far we have learned that our views of suffering are very limited and quite often wrong from either spectrum. We only see a very small part. We only have a very limited understanding of suffering, but also what we need to understand if we're really gonna under, have a better understanding of suffering is that we will never fully understand suffering. And we have to be okay with that. We will never know our whys when we suffer. God does not give their answer to the why, the reason of why we are suffering. When we ask God, why God? He doesn't always, He rarely answers. Most likely, we will not know a lot of the whys in our sufferings in this life. Because Job, Job doesn't know why he's suffering. His, his, uh, his book has, I think, 40 something chapters. Until the very end, Job still doesn't know why he's suffering. God doesn't give him the why even until the very end. We don't know why God allowed Satan to strike a righteous man. We will never know the answer to that. It's designed for us to not know. That's what it means to have a better grasp, understanding of suffering. That we're not going to understand everything then we're not going to know why most of the times. We can't really understand why God would allow Satan to strike Job 
a righteous man. That's just not given to us. And we have to be okay with that, with not really knowing why. So we can't be too simplistic and moralistic in our understanding of suffering. We can't, you know, blame God for something He didn't do. We can't expect to know all the reasons and understand suffering fully. That's just not uh, going to happen in this life. And that's so far what we see about suffering, about intense pain, something that we have been able to learn uh, from the life of Job. That, uh, you know, that's, that's just how it's going to be. We won't fully understand. After an exchange between God and Satan and the heavenly courts, the life of Job changes completely. He loses everything. He goes from the most powerful man in the East to the most pitied man in the East. He loses all of his wealth, some to you know, earthly foes like the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans that came and robbed him and killed his servants, some by heavenly uh, forces like lightning or strong wind. Uh, he lost all of his wealth, all of his animals, all of his servants. And in the very end, he lost all of his children in the same day. Ten children died at the same time. He lost everything. His one thing to lose your wealth is a completely different thing to lose not only one child, but ten children at the same time. Now that is pain. Can you even fathom that kind of pain? Can you even imagine what it would feel like to lose 10 children? Can you even imagine what it's like to be, you know, so righteous and, and to try to live a life where you try to please God with everything that you do and in return, you lose everything. In return, you lose 10 children. Can you imagine that kind of pain? Can you imagine that kind of suffering? Um, you know, we are in suffering too right now. We are in pain. I have never seen so much pain in our country uh, in, in my time here in the States. I have never seen, uh, you know, it started with the, the entire year of 2020, started with COVID-19. We have also lost our perfect lives. Many of us have also lost wealth, all of our wealth. We have lost jobs, businesses. There has been a lot of loss of life. There's been now about 6 million infected of COVID-19 worldwide around 6 million or more, and about 400,000 people that died from COVID-19 worldwide, globally. A lot of death, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And on top of that, one thing after another, you know, just when we're trying to cope with COVID-19, we see our nation in pain, divided, in pain, uh, dealing with, um, you know, uh, racism, dealing with uh, police brutality, dealing with violence and dealing with loss of, of, you know, businesses being looted and, you know, just dealing with so much division and pain and hatred and, and just so much going on. There's just so much pain. No matter where you look right now, there's so much pain right now. There's so much loss. There's so much death. There's so much violence. There's so much pain. We are in pain, intense pain, like Job was. But this is what Job did when he was in the most painful time of his life. The pain that Job had led him to worship God. 
his severe suffering, his most intense pain, led him to worship, led him to grieve his losses. You know, he, he, he put sackcloth, I mean, he, he put a robe and shaved his head. And immediately he prostrated himself and worshipped God and he blessed God. He blessed God. Job was able to continue on because he didn't lose what was most precious in his life. Job was able to hold on because he didn't lose what was of most value in his life. His, his heart, his soul was anchored in the eternal. He was able to continue on because he really loved God more than anything. He didn't put his trust, he didn't put his hope, he didn't put his love in things, his wealth, his, his animals, his children. He didn't put his hope in things that can soon be gone. And when they're gone, you are gone too. But he put his hope, his trust and love in God. Satan was wrong. Satan was so wrong. Job really loved God more than anything. And that's why when he lost everything, he can still sing. And that's why when he lost everything, he worships. And that's why when he lost everything in the midst of his most intense pain, he praises God. Because God, God is still there. He has not lost and he can never lose of what's most valuable to him. His heart was anchored in the eternal, in something he could never lose, so he can worship, so he can continue on. In the midst of the most intense pain, he can continue to sing. We are in pain, but you can direct this pain to lead you to a spiritual level in your life that you have never experienced before. This intense pain, you can direct it for good. This intense pain, you don't need to waste it. You don't need to curse God. You don't need to make you, you don't need the pain to make you bitter. You, you can direct this pain for good. You can direct this pain to a level spiritually that you have never experienced before. This pain can lead you to love God more than anything. Not the blessings that He gives, but to love God for who He is. This intense pain if you use it well, if you direct it well, if you lead it well, this intense pain can lead you to, to a place spiritually where you love God for who He is. Not because of the blessings, not because of the things that He can give you when God can no longer do anything for you, when God has nothing to offer you, when God is the one who's, who's actually attacking you, when God has no benefit to you, when He has no blessing to offer. If you let this pain, if you lead it well, it can lead you to a place where you can learn the highest form of loving and worshiping God. It can lead you to the most mature place spiritually where you can love God simply for God. Where you can love God simply for who He is, not because of what He can give you when He has nothing to offer you. You can just love Him. You can just love Him just for who He is. The purest form of love, true love, this pain, this intense pain that we are in right now, can lead you to the most beautiful place you have ever been with God. Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that what we all want? To be able to love God 
like that, just for who He is, in the purest form possible. Not to get something from Him, but just to love God for who He is. This season of intense pain, of suffering, can lead you there, can do that for you. And I hope it really does. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just your word. Lord, this season of suffering is a test for us too. We will find out if Satan was right or not in our lives as well. We will find out, it'll, it'll make us discover whether we really follow you because of what we get from you or whether we really love you or not. I pray, Lord, that you would use this time, this season of suffering, the intense pain that we are all in as a nation. Use it to lead us to love you for who you are. Not because of what we can get from you, not because of your blessings, but just to simply love you for you, even if we get nothing in return. Oh, let us arrive at that place. We cannot get there without suffering. We cannot seek to only want Jesus if we have so many other things in our lives. We can only want Jesus more than anything if Jesus is all we have. Right now, we have lost a lot of things. We have been stripped from a lot of things. Lord, use it to take us to a place that teaches us to love you only for who you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Now let's end worship with a benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.